old trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Ah, welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. This show, I don't know why I like the photograph show more than other kinds of shows, but Bill Barley is our historian and collector of photographs and artifacts and memorabilia and stuff like that. Whenever you bring in these photographs, I mean, it always starts like this, just looks like just a plain photograph, yeah. and then suddenly, a whole world of history opens yeah, up. You bet. You bet. Now, I mean, should we just start right off with the first one? For, do you, well, first of all, tell me when you know you've got a good photograph and what you look for. The image has to be very clear. There should be some notation on it. Always, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, Mike. You should know the name of the individual. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have a clue. Uh, you look for signs. You look for the, the date of the individual. And you look for unusual things in the photograph. Yes. And uh, if it's a one of a kind, it's quite valuable. So people should not loan their photographs. Uh, they should make sure that they're, they're, most of this should be in the archives. Eventually, my collection will probably go to the archives. Okay. For example, we have this great photograph of what looks like uh, just a wonderful mansion. Yeah. And I think to myself, oh, it must be Victoria. You know, one of the wealthy yeah. from Victoria. Yeah. Really, what is it about? Well, it's about one of my favorite Indian chiefs, a guy called Chief Dudaward. And Dudaward was in Port Simpson, which was originally Fort Simpson, way up there beyond Prince Rupert and kind of halfway between the Charlottes and Portland Canal in mining area. Now, he was a very wealthy man. He was an interpreter. He was a Lingot chief. And, but where did he get his money? How did he build a house that size? We don't know. He called it Eagle House. And uh, whether he was a member of the Eagle Clan, I don't know. There's another story up there that says that he saw an eagle perching on the turret of the house, and that's why he called it Eagle House. His daughters married well. I mentioned it very briefly in one of the program. They married Sternwheeler captains. When these were the princes of the rivers then, uh, he was famous all through his life. Where did he get his money? I think he got his money probably from the Charlottes, from some of the gold in the Charlottes. I'm guessing this was a, this actually, this, this, this house was taken out of a, of a, of a book of houses, and the, that was the most expensive house, and he said, I'll take that one. Yeah, because I asked you, I said, with that uh, sunburst just above the yeah. windows, I thought, was that a McClure or a Rattenbury? And yeah. you said, no, it no. came out of a catalog. That's right, it did. And there's a man standing on the lawn down in the front there. Do you think that's him? I would think so. Well, I would that's think so. fascinating. Unfortunately, it burned. It is no longer in Port Simpson. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Interesting. And, and to the average viewer, it would just be a big house somewhere, yeah. but it has mystery and intrigue and associated. It launches with it. me on a, on, a, on a journey or a quest. I want to find out where he got all the money. That's all you need. Eh? Well, I'd, I'd like to have it. That's nice perfect. Story. Okay. Picture number one. Now, if you happen to know where he got all his money, we'd uh, gladly take the phone call. This uh, one right here it just looks like sort of one of the rattiest main streets, but this was the big copper city. Uh, this was the next butte in British Columbia. This was Phoenix. We discussed Phoenix in two other different programs over the last 10 years. And this is the main street of Upper Town in Phoenix. And it isn't, it isn't that ratty, Mike, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. They had a brewery. They had... And this is an example. This is the Phoenix Brewery. And if you get one of their, one of their siphon bottles, they're worth about $500 or $600. Well, even finding just and it a, says, a label. Phoenix Brewing Company, Phoenix, B.C. That's, That's right. very important. Contains only malt and hops, absolutely pure. They have the same publicity, the same advertising That's as right. modern beer purveyors. And if you move your finger, you'll see Phoenix Brewing, Phoenix, B.C. There's Phoenix Brewing in Victoria. There's also Phoenix Brewing in Phoenix, B.C. That's very important. And Phoenix was quite wealthy. Yep. It had two railroads. It had an opera house that seated 1,000 people. It had an arena that seated 1,000 people. It has two jewelry stores right on the, one side of the main street. Black George is one e. and Day, jeweler. Yeah, Day is one, and just up the street is Black's. And Boyle, the druggist, was right there, too. Yeah, and Black is just beyond that. And what's that clock-like structure right on the middle? That's, 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 that's the, the other jeweler. Always, that's right. That's Black. Stage office the Bellevue Hotel. Yeah. All, and look at those kids wandering along oh, yeah. that boardwalk. And kids loved a boardwalk and they loved a mining town. I know I was brought up in one. And you, the <laughs> boardwalk, harbored many a treasure sure for you. Sure did. Oh, sure did. We used to go into the boardwalks and pick up all sorts of silver coins, occasionally a gold coin. Yeah, that would be just the they best would, treasure they would, of all. They would look for the gold coins. Though. So here we have a photograph taken uh, when in Phoenix's 1910. history? 1910. 1910, maybe 1912. Well, that is just, uh, that takes you back. Does yeah. it stimulate any particular quest for 
a treasure story in your mind? Not that one. Not that one. But there are some that, as we go along, we'll... Okay. This is a fine-looking ship. Is this the Esquimalt, or is it in Esquimalt? This is the Esquimalt, in Esquimalt. And this was the... The British were showing their, their presence on the Pacific coast, mostly to the Americans. And uh, so they brought this in, a 20-gun 20 20 gun ship, and uh, typical of the British ships of the line, 1860s, late 1860s, probably taken by Maynard. And uh, lots of lots of firepower. Oh, just yeah, lots keeping, of make sure everybody stays to their side of the harbor. That everyone understood. Oh, good. The British and and a fine fine. Do we know anything about the photographer here? I think Maynard. Yeah. Yeah. Fine piece of work. And uh, of course, we have to remember that Esquimalt Harbor and Victoria Harbor was one of the largest on the west coast. Oh, it sure. was one of the largest in the world on yeah, the west it was. coast. Yeah. Yeah. Very very impressive. Very impressive. Here we have from Comox. British Columbia, uh, circa what year do you figure for these? This About longhouse 18, and 1880 uh, probably. And look at that uh, totem. Yeah. A man is apparently wearing a waistcoat and a top hat. Wearing a waistcoat and top hat. Either somebody he knew, or copied. The Indians were great mimickers in many of the, and many other totems. You will see actual images from real life. So it may have been an individual they they had, they had dealt with. We don't know. Unfortunately, there was no detail on this, and that's unfortunate. And the fact that this is Comox, you know, for some reason I think of the long houses and the yeah. and the totem poles as being a, a Queen Charlotte sort of a thing. Uh, but uh, they existed down on even the central part of well, the island sure. and below. Right from Alaska, right down to uh, right down to the state of Washington. And would there be different functions for that? The small totem with the man in the top hat well, is much different than the one that's summer very clan tall. To totems, summer house totems, and so on. And read Marius Barbeau, Barbeau, and he will give you the, uh, all the information on totems that you'll ever want to know, volume one, volume two. And you know, it's the construction of these houses that is solid slab cedar. Yeah. That split, and look at the width of some of that. Yeah. That is like oh, yeah. two-foot slabs oh, of course. cedar. No, magnificent work, really. The craftspeople on the coast, the native craftspeople, uh, awesome ability. Oh, yes, and it's recognized all around the world now. All right, we're going to have to take a break here. Otherwise, you know, we could just go on and on, and nobody would ever pay the bills. But we're going to come back in just two minutes with more photographs from Bill's collection. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley with you. And today we're taking a look at some of Bill's favorite photographs, courtesy of the BC Archives and your own personal own collection personal. and other locations as yeah. well. This one is a mystery. This one has puzzled me for over 20 years. Uh, picked it up out of an album. Everything else in the album was identified. Now look at, in the middle this of town, it. cordwood by the th th thousands of cords of cordwood. Yep, definitely. What do they need cordwood for? Why do they need that much cordwood? Well, there's obviously a plant very close by, and you can see the plant. It's just down there to the left. It's got those, what, five smokestacks Yeah, I think it has it. something to do with coal. And just beyond it is another town very close by. I down, think, down, way down around the corner right. there. This individual who owned the album had been in Utah. All his identification was in British Columbia. He did not identify this town. I don't know why. Now that, I mean, Boundary Creek, you know, the, the hills no, are right there. They, my, it looks at, no, believe me, it is not. I know, the, I know the background. It is not in British Columbia. I don't think it's in the foothills of Alberta. There's no American flag showing either. I don't see any flags flying on any no, of the houses. which is interesting. That I looks think like it's a Mormon a, town in Utah. That, now, that's a major building right downtown, and just yeah. across the street from it looks like a, a, maybe a big hotel or a big major office. I think so, yeah. All right, so if anybody can identify that neck of the woods, you figure it's coal in Utah. I think so. Very interesting. Uh, and all of the houses hopefully are... Hopefully an educated guess. All right. Now, this is one of these beautiful little uh, keepsakes in itself. Sure. A colored, hand-colored, um, what do you call it? Postcard. Postcard. Thank you very much yep. for filling that in. And who's... Uh, Fire Hall, Vancouver, British Columbia. Boat 19.9. This very is when they got their new mechanized equipment in, Mike. Look at there. Just as proud of it. They're are all standing they, there. Are they ever? Buttons, brass polished, and away they go. Yeah. And this is important for two reasons. They obviously sold these by the hundreds. Oh, yeah, sure they did. But on the back, of course, Vancouver. This is June 28th. This was sent at 2.30 in the afternoon. Dear friend. Yeah. Why would they say dear friend as opposed to Typical the name? of the day. Very formal. Privacy? Very formal. I hope you are all well. I'm coming over on Friday's boat. If you have no objections, love to all. A. Hicks. Look at that. Very nice indeed. 
Okay, so that just says to you, sure. state of the art, that particular yep. year, fire department, proud, and sure. what's going on. Now, the Mucho Oro mine yep. has to be, I mean, Williams one of the Creek. most famous. It's in Williams, Williams Creek. Creek. Produced about, probably, the records say less, but probably about two tons of Placer Gold mine. These two guys tons. should look happier than they, they do. They should all have a grin on their face. Yep. They don't. But they should all have a grin on their face. And um, you can see three Chinese on the left-hand side of the photograph, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And uh, there are about, uh, I think, 15, 15 people in the photograph. Now, there's a guy holding what looks like a hay rake. What would he use that, or a hay fork? What would he use that hay fork for, that guy? Is that, is that part of the, of, the, of the gravel agitation yeah, that's equipment? That's for forking down and getting the boulders out of the sluice box. That's what that sure. fork is for? Yeah. And the other, the other guys have sort of typical pick and shovel kind of activities. Sure. And that big, what, what is that a Cornish wheel that they call it? That's an overshot wheel, yeah, Cornish yep. wheel. And they would use that for doing what? Well, bringing the water in. You have to have water if you're going to run the sluice boxes. So, and it would, would it also turn something? Would oh, it yes. operate the shakers or something? Yeah, no, no, no shakers. Just run the water into the sluice box. All bring right. Bring a line into it. That's an overshot wheel. And so the Mucho Oro, very successful mine. One of about 30 spectacular mines in Williams Creek. Now, this is another uh, postcard, but it has this massive skull of a mastodon on the, yeah. on the front. Mammoth yeah. skull. And it also has, it's a mastodon skull, that's right. true. It also has, that's about seven, seven feet on the tusks. It has some information. Discovered at 42 feet below. Right at the bottom in little tiny print at a depth of 42 feet on number five below, AMAX Discovery, Quartz Creek, Yukon Territory, March 5th, 1904. Look at the size of that tusk, yeah. seven feet six. And they came across, still coming across the, the remains of mastodons, some of them beautifully preserved in the Yukon, some of them beautifully preserved. And that one has never been filled in by anybody on no. the back, so no. fascinating. This clapboard false front <laughs> something or other. What, pretty crude. Yeah, pretty crude, basics yeah. first of its kind. Yeah. Well, it's built by a guy called Jim Bowes Is in Silver. Is he in this shot anywhere? Yeah, I think he's with the horse. I'm not sure. I can't find a picture of Jim Bowes. I'd love to. He was a well-known character in the slow can. And, uh, in fact, a man, <coughs> a man wrote him back about this photograph. A man, a man in Nelson found the photograph, a guy called St. Dennis, and he wrote Bowes, who was in Vancouver at that time, and said, Bowes, can you identify any of these individuals? He wrote him a quarter of a century later. Bowes identified all 23 individuals, including the guy who's blurry on the left-hand side of this photograph. Mm -hmm. He identified all of them by first and, and, and last names and said, and he finished up the letter, but I'll be damned if I can remember the name of the horse. And it was his horse. <laughs> it was a quarter of a century later. Do <laughs> you remember the dog? Do you have a theory that there's a dog in every one of these pictures? Well, there usually is a dog. And when you're a saloon, there's a dog. There he goes. So yeah. Bowes was a great character, a gambler, I understand. He, he was a gambler and a very successful gambler who knew nothing about it and would always just take a long shot and usually win. And uh, he was an astonished guy. He came from, from the Slocan Valley right into Kelowna and established the Lakeview Hotel in Kelowna right next to where the stern wheeler docked. Well, for heaven's sake. And then went down, retired, sold the Lakeview and retired in Vancouver. So you're saying he was a, a gambler but knew nothing about it. He just would take any bet. See, which, and if which, a guy said it's black, sure. he'd say, I'll take it's white. Yeah, that's right. As long as there's some sort of chance and he'd invariably win. Bet $100 at a time. That was a lot of money then. Bose. Yeah, Jim Bowes. B-O-W-E-S. All right. This is a, is this an Indian graveyard? Yes, it is. Where? Kitwankul. And uh, typical of the graveyards in that Skeena River country. In fact, all the way along the coast in many instances, but mostly in the north coast. They have those grave houses. Still see them in Kitwanga, Kitwankul, Kitsigukla, and uh, all through that Skeena country. And it's rather fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Now, a little earlier we saw a totem pole carved in the form of the Boston man with a yeah. top hat and waistcoat. This looks like Russian architecture. Did they take some... Some uh, Russian don't, styles here? The, yeah, there's a little bit of influence from, from Alaska, but not a lot, Mike. I yeah. mean, that, that goes back a long, long ways in that north country. So, uh, and it's really quite fascinating. You can still go into some of those areas and see the old, the old cemeteries, the old Indian cemeteries. And I've, I've always been fascinated with them. Another shot, this from one of the great gold finds, the White Channel of, uh, yeah. up in uh, Gold Hill, Yukon sure. Territory. Gold Hill, Chicago, uh, French Hill, uh, all sorts of hills. And that was where they were mining the White Channel, which was an old, ancient run of the original creeks, such as El Dorado and Bonanza and Quartz and all the rest of it. When they hit the White Channel, they hit gold in quantity. Some of these individuals we were making to the equivalent of an individual going out today and making $50,000 a day. Now, 
a, a school for mining could have taken this picture because sure. it's got everything there. What is the smokestack on the right-hand side? You know what I, that I, is? They, well, it, it's almost looking like he has a dory bar, but I'm not sure. I think that may be steam for getting down. There's, I think there's a shaft in that photograph. That's Mike. right, and these guys are winching yeah. on that windlass. That's right, and so they're, they're, they're getting down through the permafrost, and that's why they'd have to have steam All right. to, to kind of soften up that earth rather than have hard heart. They bring up the stuff, and then look at There's two other, three other people along the uh, shaker boxes. Yeah. What are they called, rocker boxes? Rockers. And uh, there they are. They're miles away from the Earth's and water. And they're happy, and they're working six days a week. And, they're, and some of them are doing, well, most of them are doing absolutely spectacularly well. Absolutely well, What did you say? I was not paying attention. Did you say $50,000? About 50000 It would be equivalent to $50,000 today. They were, making, uh, they were making 100 ounces a day, a lot of them. All, I mean, pretty steadily. Yep. 100 ounces a day is, is, is $50,000 a day All right. today. This is another beautiful uh, example of uh, Indian sculpture or uh, carving. Yeah. And where is this taken? I think that's the Nimkish area on Vancouver Island. And uh, I think it has a sign on it, Mike. And, uh, Talan uh, Company Glass, Nimkish Chief. Nimkish Chief. So he uses some white words there. And I, again, I think that's 1880s. It may be a little earlier, but it's probably Maynard, uh, I think and typical of the Indian villages of the time. And, and that's right down in the beach. You can see that's the, uh, the gravel and the broken sure. shells and stuff oh, yeah. and, the, and the logs up on the beach. Yeah. And look at that carving, just spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, I'm going to yes. take a break here we're gonna, because we're rapidly running out of time. But when we come back, uh, some stern wheelers and other things as we take a look at our photo collection today. Welcome back uh, to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We're taking a look at artifacts, photographs of Bill's collection, and also in the uh, provincial archives. The Bonington, you figure, was the queen of all sternwheelers in British Columbia. I think so. Uh, you, you can say the Nasukan might have been, or maybe the SS Sycamus. I think the Bonington was by far the best. It was a magnificent ship and sailed through that West Kootenai country on the Arrows. and. Uh, uh, it, it had all the fittings. It, it really dwarfed the Sycamus and the Nasukan, who were almost sister ships. Yeah. And it, uh, of course, a CPR ship, so it had the silver, it had the uh, sure. Chinaware, it had the service. CPR flag. CPR flag. Yeah. One of your favorite things, oh, yeah. the CPR flag. Yeah. And there it is plying its uh, route up the Arrow Lakes yeah. and uh, looking very proud. Interesting postcard on the back, too, all written in another language mm -hmm. uh, to a Mr. Peter uh, Bumowski. Yes, I think that's probably Ukrainian, right on. which is interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. This is a photograph of a, a board ship. Would this also be in Esquimalt? That's in Esquimalt as well. And who is the man affecting a Napoleonic stance? <laughs> that's the captain. And like would he be team. British, and where for, therefore why? He would be British. Uh, why? Uh, they were impressed with Napoleon. He was a military genius, and uh, regardless of your, of your race, and uh, they, uh, they did respect Napoleon's genius, and uh, he thinks he's another Napoleon. He probably isn't. Now, there, oh, you can see this is a great one for showing the guns. There's, of yep. course, the guns that point out the side, but they have a, a wheeled one in the middle. Would they, yeah, they wheel do. that one up and down the deck for some reason? I guess so. Uh, I'm not that familiar I with hadn't it. I thought about that. I think that. that's, again, that's a Maynard photograph, but those are probably 20-pounders, maybe 16-pounders, I'm not sure. And uh, typical of the, uh, of the ships of the line at that era. Now, maybe that's why they called it the bridge. Look at it. It just looks like a bridge across the sure. deck that they would be up on. Of course. Very of course. interesting yeah. And, shot. of course, the officers are on the bridge and the men are down below. Of course. Or the sailors. Nanaimo. I knew it was Nanaimo as soon as I saw the bastion there. Yeah. Uh. But this, this photograph fascinates me because down in the f bottom front, mm -hmm. it looks like a camera on a tripod yeah, right there. Yeah, it does, actually. There's not much doubt about it. I think that's one of his extra cameras, and that's the one that, uh, that he uses for the very, very formal portraits or photographs. And, of course, it's it's He had his portable a, model up on the hill for yeah, this I shot. I think he did, obviously. <laughs> Maybe he couldn't carry it up. Obviously, he couldn't carry it very far. And that, that tells you a lot about Nanaimo of the day. And Nanaimo still has some of those buildings, and that photograph, Mike, are still there. And that was taken about 115 years ago. That is just marvelous. Well, yeah. the, we, we can locate ourselves perfectly from the bastion because that's been uh, kept at that same location. Sure. And everything else looked very solid brick buildings in yep. some places. It's and, changed a bit. The foreshore has changed a bit, Mike. Well, somebody went and parked the Malaspina Hotel on well, it and yeah. other things. And finally, this shot, which again shows uh, coastal native people. Yep. 
Where would this be taken? That's Nanaimo, uh, Chief's house in Nanaimo, probably 1880 again, Mike, about 115 years ago, by Maynard, almost certainly, professional photographer, and uh, shows the family there, and uh, they're looking, they always look very solemnly at the camera. The, the Indian nations were not too sure of the camera, with some exceptions. And uh, the, ho the house post is, is really quite interesting indeed, and of course, massive, massive building structure there. Well, uh, some Native people felt that the camera was actually going to steal their soul. Steal their, uh, yes, yeah, stole their image, stole their soul, and that's why they were a little cautious. And they, um, they didn't go around grinning all the time, so they felt they wouldn't grin all the time. Right. I mean, and, why? Uh, that's logical. In fact, many of our early, early photographs of groups are individuals who have a very serious look. Uh, they do not grin. And again, the value of these photographs is that it establishes time and place, sure. clothing, uh, construction yeah. techniques, uh, development at that yeah. stage, yeah. Uh, personalities, attitudes. I mean, it's a, a, a novel, a story could be written it's, about it, every one of them. It's it, it clues to a puzzle. And if you get a good photograph, it'll tell you a lot of answers about an area that maybe a sign is there, Mike. It might be an individual that's recognizable. It might be a mine. It might be a background. It might be anything. And that, that gives you a clue to the history of the area. Perfect. That's why the photographs are extremely important. And I've said before, and I'll say it again, always keep your photographs in a dry, cool place. If you do not, do not expose it to fluorescent light or natural light or sunshine for sure, because they will fade and you won't notice it until they're gone. So be very, very careful of your photographs. And they are treasures, because you see sure them so are. often, they're now the material that uh, decorates uh, walls of uh, commercial establishments. Yep. And if you want to see, I guess, your family up on one of those, uh, give them the right to use it, but they sure. are your own personal treasures. Yeah, they are. Some items that can go along with uh, some artifacts that we've talked about. Nelson, British Columbia. This is a beautiful little piece of, uh, of glassware. Who do you think was responsible for creating this? I'm positive that was J.O. Patented. I just picked this up the other day. I have another one. There were three sizes. I have two of the three, cranberry glass. And uh, it has Nelson, B.C., and anything that he sold, he wanted to advertise Nelson. He was the major jewelry out, uh, outfitter in Nelson. He had two outlets in Nelson, and this was the kind of thing he would have sold. That, so that goes in the permanent collection for sure. These beads, if you are walking along a Vancouver Island beach, mm -hmm. you may absolutely miraculously discover individuals of these. Yes, and in certain areas you might or... Um, and I'm not going to say where, but you would find some of these on some of the old village sites. Uh, they're quite valuable. They're called a Canton bead or a Russian bead. They're a blue faceted bead. And um, probably made in, in Canton, I think. They may have been made in Murano, Italy, but I think Canton. And is this a sort of historically intact, or is this one you've assembled in this No, form? That, came, that came intact like that. It was picked up by an Indian I purchased it many years ago. Fascinating. If you have <laughs> photographs, care for them. We'll see you next time on Gold Troll. <laughs>